Okay then, so um, without further ado, let's get started. Um, my name is Madeline Ward. I'm team lead um, for collections here at Aberdeen Archives, Gallery and Museums. And um, as you've probably gathered by now, I'm gonna be your host for this evening. Um, in a moment, um, I will hand over to the main event. Um, today's five artists who have kindly joined us um, we'll start with Anne Marquis, then we'll move on to Juliet McLeod, then Lynn Hocking Many, Ursula Mathers, and then we'll tie up this evening's conversation with Kimberly Petrie. The five artists will take it in turns to share their work and their experiences of taking part in the Micro Commissions programme. Um, before I hand over, however, um, and I suppose for the un uninitiated, um, I wanted to highlight what a micro commission actually is. Um, if you don't know, you may be Im imagining any number of things. Um, but as the name suggests, um, micro commissions are small scale, fast paced creative projects. And in this instance, all of the creative projects are artistic responses to various objects within the collections of Aberdeen Archives, Gallery and Museums. So um, the artists that, um, that applied had a kind of a vast array, a real, a real wealth of a collection to choose from. So we were fascinated to see what they connected with and what, um, what the results were of, of the experience of them, of them responding to pieces within our collection. Over the course of 2021, we were able to support 12 unique and inspiring micro commissions. And we were able to do this as a result of Aberdeen Art Gallery's success as joint winner of Art Fund of the Year, 20, um, Art Fund Museum of the Year in 2020. As part of um, that victory, I suppose you'd call it, uh, we were awarded £45,000 in, in prize money. And when you're given a sum of money like that, kind of all kinds of ideas come, come to the fore as to how to how best to spend it. But in the end, it became an absolute no brainer that the way way to use this huge sum of money was to look for an opportunity to support our local creative community. We really felt that it was it was a step that we could take to increase the visibility and diversity of work made locally within our internationally recognised collections. We saw it as a real opportunity to learn a lot more and get a lot more hands on with the local artistic economy and community and really begin to understand what kind of support was needed and in demand locally. So for us as an organisation, it's been a huge kind of, a, a kind of pleasure and a privilege to work with the 12 artists, but it's been a huge learning curve and, and development experience. And I know, kind of, I, I speak honestly in saying that myself and my colleagues, we, we benefited hugely from the experience. So I'd like to take the opportunity to, to, to thank all of the artists for applying and, um, and working with us. So because there was this local emphasis, um, we, we put out a brief in which we invited artists and makers living within AB postcodes to submit proposals of ways in which they wanted to respond to our collections. Um, our goal was to encourage as much creativity, innovation and kind of out there thinking as was was possible. So we didn't instill or embed rules around practice um, or working in a particular medium. We were open to what, but open to being led by what the artists applying wanted to achieve um, through their micro commission. And I think as you as attendees here hear more about um, the five projects that will be discussed e this evening, you'll very quickly begin to realise how impressive the results have been. What was particularly remarkable um, when, um, when this, this project, project was initiated was that we moved into a period of, of lockdown, global pandemic, all, all of these things happening and, and the way we'd normally imagine the ways we'd normally imagine, imagine we would work and engage with each other and create and, and discuss and, and even show, invite, art, invite the artists in to see the collections and see 
physically be in the presence of what they wanted to respond to. All those things that we thought were just naturally going to happen couldn't happen. And I think that makes it all the more remarkable um, as um, about what, 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 what the participants have been able to achieve. Um, and it's certainly fair to say that the, the newly created works are kind of a, a real testimony to the, the creativity and the endeavours of, of everybody involved. So again, a, a huge thanks for sharing sharing your work and, and, and those experiences with us. So that's kind of, I think that's kind of enough from me now. And um, it's with huge delight that I'm able to hand over to our first artist this evening, Anne Marquis, who will introduce you to her fascinating project and um, experience of the Micro Commission programme. Over to Anne. Hello, I'm Anne Marquis. I'm a jeweller. Um, I studied at Grace School of Art and I'm an Aberdonian. And I grew up uh, being inspired by Aberdeen Art Gallery from a very young age. And it has given me so much inspiration and knowledge uh, that I've gleaned from it over the years. So the opportunity to actually um, work on this commission was a huge thing for me, a real privilege. Um, over the years, I've looked at so many images of women that are represented in the art gallery and on closer inspection found that most of them have been created by male artists. So it made me think, I want to know more about what work is being made by women. So I started to look around and decided that this would be the vehicle that I would use to actually create uh, my commission. My idea was to make a charm bracelet. Um, as you all know, charm bracelets are often a special present that are given mostly to young girls, maybe when they're just turning into their teens. And they're given charms to add to their bracelet as they get older. And each of these charms signify a special moment in their lives. It might be for a special birthday or they've maybe been on holiday and chosen a charm to take back home. All these things get added to the bracelet and this is almost like a little record of their life as they grew up. So I thought a charm bracelet was a really suitable medium to use to help display charms that I have made in response to some of the work by women artists in the gallery. I think what's interesting is that the women I selected hadn't represented physical women in their work. In fact, there was only really one, and you can see that in the top left corner of a girl with her arms stretched out. That was the only piece that actually showed the representation of a, a woman. The other paintings and pieces of artwork that I picked out were actually conveying a deeper message rather than just an image of a woman. They were actually concerned with social issues that each of these women artists were actually trying to convey. And they were doing that through their work uh, in lots of different media. Um, I started off the bracelet by thinking about the chain, the central part that was going to hold all the charms. And one of the women artists that has really stood out for me over the years is Barbara Hepworth. I've been fortunate uh, to visit the Hepworth Gallery in Wakefield and also the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, um, not far from there and seen a lot of her work firsthand. And it is really beautiful. I think the strong, simple shapes that she uses was the perfect um, idea for me to actually create my bracelet and form the links. If you want to show the next slide, please, that will show you some sketches. This sketch here is part of the sketchbook that I made. And you can see perhaps in the, the left side there, the famous uh, 
open sculpture that is now situated in the balcony of the gallery. As a girl, I used to go and visit it when it was located in the fountain in the middle of the gallery floor. And so it's really special to me. So to make a piece of jewellery based on that, it's just brilliant. I think the other charms really each has its own story and I've catalogued that on Instagram uh, with a little note about each of the women artists um, and why their charm for me is, is so important. What I hope is that this bracelet is a sort of a signpost in a way for women of today and tomorrow to look at each of these charms and think about what they represent and perhaps go back and look at the piece of art that they're related to and consider the really powerful um, messages that they're trying to convey. I think at the bottom of it all, it's so important for people to understand that creativity and um, expressing yourself in any sort of way is a really powerful mess method of tackling issues of all sorts um, that we meet in our lives to, to today. And I think, especially during lockdown, I think a lot of people have actually gone back and found their inner creativity to keep themselves occupied and um, challenged uh, during this really difficult time. So ultimately, I, I want to dedicate this bracelet to women and to the young girls of the future and to make them think about just how important creativity is for all of us and how much we can benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you so much Anne, that was fascinating and thank you for the dedication and thank <laughs> you for the um, for, for sharing that such, such, such clear messaging a really 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 interesting um, summary there. Okay, then um, next on on um, on my list is Juliet McLeod. So over to Juliet. Hi there. Um, I'm Juliet McLeod, and I am a potter who works in porcelain. Um, and my work is um, profoundly affected by the Scottish coast. So when I um, um, found out about the micro commissions and discovered that one of the topics or themes that we could cover was to do with climate change, um, I jumped at the chance of creating a piece that address um, particularly things to do with the, um, <coughs> excuse me, coastal erosion. 41% um, of the Scottish population live within about five miles of the coast. So erosion, flood damage, in, increased number of storms, etc., affects all of us hugely. And the places that are such importance to us, both from a point of view of where we live, but also for um, recreation. So um, I created this piece, which is called The Rising Sea, and it's two um, rows of porcelain pots. That they're made from recycled porcelain, and they refer to two elements. So the row in front of you um, refers to the rising sea. So each piece increases in size. And then the pieces behind refer to the coast, or the coast diminishing in size as the sea rises. Next slide, please. Um, I used a series of techniques that involved erosion. So the pieces on the left hand side of this slide um, are vessels that are etched with water. So you throw a pot and when it's still unfired, you use some kind of resist, in this case shellac, and you wash away areas. So um, you create, I created this kind of wave like form by washing away some of the, um, the clay to create this um, kind of almost engraved surface. And then the other row of pieces were created using um, a, a process called soda firing, where you add salt into a final firing and the salt creates a glaze, but it also 
erodes the surface details. So in this case, I had used coloured marking using um, pigments and clay. And these had been slightly worn away, the colours had changed and they'd sort of eroded. So using different techniques to suggest this erosion, even to the plinth that's used, um, I created that out of Scottish larch and it's, um, I've used a technique called shosugi ban, which is a Japanese technique where you burn the surface of the wood. Um, and although it erodes it in a certain way, it actually finally gives it more longevity. And you can find um, Japanese temples that are hundreds of years old, made of cedar, for example, that use this technique. Um, the pieces were inspired by um, the work of Francis Walker um, and Joan, um, Joan Erdley, who are two artists who've had a profound effect on my work um, in the last 10 years. I had discovered them before um, I moved to Aberdeen in 2010, but um, it was a joy when I first visited the art gallery and found both of their work as part of the commission as it's had a, you know, a profound effect on me. Um, for those who don't know, um, Frances Walker is a local artist. Um, she uses a, a, a series of different medias, but she's particularly known for her um, printmaking. And so the left hand row of pieces were very much inspired by her engraving process. Whereas the right hand pieces, which were inspired by Joan Erdley's work, um, refer to a, um, Catiline, a, a, a place at Catiline Beach, which is where she lived in the later years of her life. And there is a rock there called Kale Tap or the Pudding Stone. And so I used some found um, ephemera from Catiline Beach and used that to print um, the shape which refers to that rock and to the harbour wall. Um, I really enjoyed this process um, of working on this micro commission. It led me down a whole new series of paths that I'd, um, I'd wanted to um, sort of experiment with um, before, but this was a, a real excuse to have the time, to take the time, to be able to afford to take the time to experiment with these new techniques. So I'm very grateful to the um, Aberdeen Art Gallery for awarding me this. Thank you very much. Wow, I mean, thank you, Juliet, the, the amount of information you managed to just pack into five minutes there, absolutely incredible. And I feel, I mean, the, the way you describe the, the various techniques, I think so many people will be going, never heard of that, <laughs> never heard of that. But it was to, to have your work in front of us and, and, and describe it like that was absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. Um, next, then, um, I will shine the spotlight on to Lynn. Lynn hocking many, please. Hi, thanks very much, Madeline, and to everyone for, for coming along tonight. Um, like everyone else here tonight, I'm incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity to be part of these um, Micro Commissions Awards. I am a hand weaver with a studio in Aberdeen City Centre here. I started weaving back in 20. 16 after leaving my past life as an academic scientist working in the field of human genetics and I learned to weave while I was um, while I was traveling around the world with my family in 2016 using a backstrap loom. At the time I learned to weave I wasn't aware that there was a very strong uh, connection within my family to weaving but um, this did become apparent once I started digging around into our family history. And that has really informed the work that you can see in the image here. When I saw the brief for the micro commissions, I was really intrigued by the idea that then there was a desire to consider perhaps gaps in the collection, and not only to respond to works that were in there already, but to think about perhaps how collecting histories have um, uh, a kind of a selection bias inherent within them. The work that I create is very much about kind of giving physical form to data. So even though I don't work as an academic scientist anymore, I still work with genetics and with ancestry information in the objects that I create. And I try to convey information about these to these objects. What I've created for the micro commission, um, I started working with flax 
fibre. This is something that seven generations ago in my family, this is something that my ancestors were working with. So a little bit of family history research has revealed that in every single one of the last seven generations from myself back to my four great grandmother and her generation, there has been at least one person in every generation involved with the weaving trade in northeast Scotland. So I was born and brought up in Angus and moved to Aberdeen as an 18 year old to attend university here. And uh, apart from that year spent traveling around the world, have never left Aberdeen and now call it home. As you can see, uh, perhaps in this image, which was taken not far from my house, I live just on the coast on the edge of the city. And it's very much kind of situated within rural um, kind of ex-farming community, in fact, still current farming communities with Queenie's Farm, um, and that kind of intersection between farm and, and fish. And that also is something that informs the work that I create. Um, and references back to my kind of family heritage, which is very much a rural one. What I was thinking about when I was creating this work was actually um, some of these heritage skills that are fundamental, or how were fundamental to the region, um, manufacturing textiles, manufacturing brown linen that was created from flax, is something that um, was a huge employer in the northeast of Scotland uh, through the 17th, um, kind of into the early um, kind of 18th centuries very early uh, 1900s for my own family. It kind of held on in the, in the Northeast for a bit longer than it did in other parts of the UK. Um, and what I became aware of is that these textiles have very rarely made it into museum and gallery collections. And where they have done, um, it hasn't been on their own merit. So perhaps if um, the textile was used as a sailcloth on a famous warship, then that sailcloth might be in a museum collection somewhere because it was a part of the warship, not because the textile itself was valued. So what I wanted to do was to just really simply recreate some of these straightforward, functional, utilitarian fabrics that were really commonly made, through which many families in the Northeast have kind of secured their, their economic viability. Um, I'm here today because my ancestors were successfully able to make a career weaving these fabrics originally brown linen, laterally jute, and um, now myself a, a kind of very much more contemporary craft practice. So I'm interested in how these heritage skills are passed on. I'm interested in how we value them. There's certainly something that was kind of very much backgrounded within my own family, not something that was kind of held up as, as something to value. Um, and I want to do that with this work here, kind of put it um, Kind of make it the hero, make the fabric the hero, make the skills that sit behind the, the, the work the hero. And also kind of get us thinking very much about that connection to place. So actually how that, that kind of understanding of local geographies, uh, what grows well, how we can create um, the objects that we need with a really kind of small carbon footprint really. So the flax would have been grown locally, it would have been processed locally and created into fabric locally to serve local needs. But actually also to very much serve a, a global market. And that's another thing I would like to do with this work here is to think about those kind of seven generations in my own family. And what you can see here, there's, um, there's a kind of a square on the fabric for each of the seven generations, all created on a single continuous warp. Um, so the idea that a, a thread runs through these seven generations, and that's the title of the work, Ancestral Connections, the thread runs through. Um, is thinking about the um, how does this how is this information passed on between generations within families? How do we value it? Um, but also thinking through those more kind of global connections. Thinking um, this work was kind of created just after a lot of the kind of Black Lives Matter movement following the murder of George Floyd um, a couple of years ago, and I was very much thinking then about the, how how we kind of understand systematic racism within the world around about us, um, how as kind of individuals and families, particularly white working class families, understand their own the kind of interconnections between um, past um, slave trading histories and economic success. And really wanting to kind of pose questions about um, how, how do we understand those interconnections through the warp and weft and the interconnections of this work. And what you can see on this slide here is a detail shot um, 
of the piece itself and hopefully if you haven't already you'll have a chance to visit the art gallery and see it for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating and I really enjoyed the kind of how you explain the connections between kind of your that personal family history, the the heritage of the region and how that kind of emerges through through your work. So absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, next over to Ursula Mathers. Hello, yes. Um, I was very excited and grateful as well to have been granted this um, micro commission. Um, I began with the intention of responding to the gallery um, in response to, to women and women's work and the female aesthetic. Um, I was very interested in having the process lead the way. And so I kept my ideas very open um, and I jumped into to sketching from, from the collection, unfortunately online, but still it was great to have kind of that push uh, especially during COVID, to to be creative. Um, so kind of every day I did different sketches of women, um, women's work, women, the embroiderers, um, the muscle gatherers. Um, uh, and so I, I kind of started to go down different ideas. Um, I started to think about what what it is that kind of symbolizes women and women's work. Um, I started doing um, little images of hands, you know, hands working as to symbolize care. Um, I also started um, stitching into the canvas uh, because there's so many um, sampler um, things in the collection, um, stitching work, which is the craft work that women, you know, could do and have something, you know, in the, in the um, gallery as well. Um, I started putting masks on paintings so kind of sketching images, paintings, and then putting the mask on. That was an interesting process to work with. Um, it was, it was, it was, it felt very like kind of almost violating to not have their full expression. Um, and you know, it's something that we were all dealing with with COVID, um, but also in the sense of. Um, you know, feminism and thinking about women's voices in the sense that, you know, when you mask someone, you you, you close their voice off, you, you turn their voice off. So that was an interesting um, experimentation. I also did looked at, um, you know, what what is going on in women's rights right now. And um, I did some images, uh, mostly abstract work with uh, menstruation justice. Um, yeah, strong uh, pieces. Um, also looked at possibly doing a, a black queen in Elizabeth's robes. Um, but anyhow, I kept on thinking about it. You know, what is that I, idea behind what I want to put forward? And I was really um, inspired by Wilhelmina Barnes' uh, painting of protest. And it's these blocks in a line that then fall apart. And so I was thinking, how can I symbolize, you know, woman today in terms of, you know, all that's going on with COVID and, you know, so many women lost their jobs due to caring issues. And, and also it relates to who I am as a mother, as a wife, as a woman, as an artist. Um, so then I started thinking, you know, what kind of abstract forms can um, kind of encompass this? Of these ideas. Um, I started looking at the gallery, um, Barbara Hepworth's work, uh, the Neolithic balls, which are very um, yeah, round and um, motherly. Um, also ceramic vases. I was really drawn to this kind of sensual form of the ceramic vase and um, which is also very feminine. Um, so anyhow, if you could change the slide, thank you. So basically I eventually was inspired by Tracy Emmons' work um, her, for you and at the end of her message, there's a little X which is symbolic of um, a text message kiss. And so this is one 
one thing that I believed is um, also representative of, of woman, symbolizing care, um, love, relationship, sexuality. Um, so it became, organically became this, uh, this X that kind of danced off the page. Whereas the, um, the shape on the right was uh, inspired by Barbara Hepworth's meditation, which is a stone with a circle on it. Um, so it was very, very heavy and encompassing and round and warm, um, but also very delicate and solid. Um, so I wanted to do that to, to kind of emphasize that strength in terms of um, the heavy paint and but also etching into the, the canvas um, delicately with lines. Um, so yeah, so the X and the O eventually became um, opposite. So, and also I, I was trying to, to balance opposites um, in terms of colors, in terms of forms. Um, and the X can also be symbolic of the XX chromosome for women um, or the XO, the, the female gender sign. Um, but basically I was interested in, in the idea that these two images are, are working together, are trying to find a way to work together and trying to strive towards a balance. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the title Becoming was inspired by philosophers Deleuze and Guattari who talked about um, becoming woman as, as a state of progression, as a state of change. And so, yeah, I would hope that these pieces would kind of make people start to think about, you know, what, how, how, to, find, how to find balance. And I think that's, I think that's, that's what, you know, um, I was working towards at that point. Um, and I think that's, yeah, at the heart of the, the, the feminist struggle, equality and uh, finding balance. So it's been, it was a great process to, to do this micro commission. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Ursula. Again, fascinating. And, and thank you for kind of shining that, that spotlight on the amount of sort of research, development and experimentation that that has took place um, for, for your work to be developed. And I'm sure that's something all the other artists will be able to agree. Um, there was a great deal of in, in creating um, the finished piece. Over now to Kimberly Petrie, um, our final speaker this evening. Hi, I'm Kimberly Petrie. I'm a poet and spoken word artist in Aberdeen. Um, and when I heard about the micro commissions, I knew immediately that I wanted to put myself forward for it. Um, basically, the art galleries always had a huge impact on me as I was growing up my grandma used to take me um, and every time I would go in I was always drawn to the same painting and so for me the idea behind the micro commission was to have three different spoken word pieces um, all to do with the the painting The Flood in the Highlands by Edwin Landseer. Um, the painting itself, I don't know why I was so drawn to it when I was little because it's really bleak. It's, you know, there's a lot going on, but it's really, it's not a happy scene. Um, but I was always fascinated by it and so drawn to it. Um, so I decided quite early on that I knew I wanted to have one spoken word piece that was from maybe the the perspective of the mother within the painting um, and to have it really to do with the scene and everything that was going on. Um, and then my second piece I decided was going to be about Landseer and his life. Um, and then the third piece was going to be about visiting the art gallery with my grandma. Um, so I decided while I was doing this that what I wanted to do was to make it really come alive and make it really atmospheric. So I worked with um, another artist um, who was able to really 
take me into his studio and um, we sort of played around with sounds about wind and rain and sort of howling noises so that in in the first piece it really really makes it quite atmospheric um, and then we did the same for the last piece to do with visiting with my grandma so we sort of pulled different sounds out that made you think about being in the art gallery you know sort of footsteps across marble floors and those kinds of things um, and I think probably the the, the piece that I did about Lancy himself was the one that really touched me the most, it was finding out a lot more about his life. Um, I mean, everyone thinks of Lancy as this, you know, wonderful painter, which he was. Um, and he was, you know, a sort of favourite with uh, Queen Victoria and Albert and then um, ended up having an affair with a, a duchess who was 20 years his senior um, and they just they carried on this affair for years and years and eventually once her husband died he proposed to her she said no um, and it just I think it just sparked off this downward spiral in him you know he really sort of descended into depression and alcoholism and you know used a lot of medication to sort of dull his you know his pain that he was in um and he ended up being in an asylum which i thought was incredibly sad um that you know for someone who's seen as being such a great painter you know could then end up on the downward spiral that he did um which i think is even though you know this painting is from a long time ago i think even today it's something that resonates with everyone is that you know, we've all had our heart broken and could end up, you know, feeling quite, quite depressed about the whole situation. Um, so, I mean, the the whole process for me, whether it was about the the connection that the art gallery has to me as an Aberdonian, as as my childhood, and you know, the way that it it has an effect on me with my family, um, to the painting itself that was quite literal, to then delving deeper behind the man who did the painting. Um, yeah, the whole process was uh, was fascinating for me. Um, if we could just move on to the, the next slide, please. Um, so here you'll see the, the three poems are on display so that you can read them. And there's also a QR code that you can scan so that you can listen to the pieces as well. Um, so I would really sort of recommend that everyone listens to them because it really does add to the the atmosphere, I think. Um, and one of the things that I like the most is that the QR code is up beside the actual painting. So while you're viewing the painting in its entirety, and it does look quite epic, um, you can also listen to to the poems at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And um, I think for me, the chance to to have my work on display in the art gallery has been such a huge achievement you know it's really it's meant such a lot to me and I think I don't know about everyone else um, and this is probably something that I would put out to all the artists is um, in terms of confidence in themselves and in their own work has doing the commission you know made you feel as if you've got more confidence or I don't know maybe it's just a personal thing but I know for me I'm always prone to sort of second guess my worth and whether I'm good enough and things like that. But now, after doing the commission, there's so many opportunities that have come along and I've just been like, well, I'm just going to go for it because if the art gallery, you know, if I'm in the art gallery, then I can do anything. <laughs> so, yeah, so I would like to say thank you to the art gallery because I'm, um, yeah, I'm definitely a lot more confident. Well, we, we accept your your thanks with, uh, with open arms, Kimberly. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I was I was fascinated with your project with kind of the the layers of, of response, the di different layered responses to, to one artwork and, and just kind of emphasizing that point that there's no right way or wrong way 
for for engaging and I actually think your your project kind of lays down a, a bit of a challenge to us as curators who are tasked with making work accessible and you've shown so many different different ways of of, of approaching and and engaging with quite a, quite a, well a truly iconic work within the collection um so I think you know we're, we're, we've Draw, drawing to to the close of of this evening's event, I, I saw a couple of questions flashing up in the chat, but I think people have been answering them as they go along. Um, and but I think it would be I think Kimberly kind of posed something interesting there around this idea of kind of the confidence boosting and and what what the process has meant. Um, because certainly one uh, one of the goals of the of the micro commissions project was for artists to consider how taking part in the process would develop their practice or develop yourselves personally or professionally. So I'm really pleased that Kimberly kind of emphasised that that point there at the end that there has been kind of a a positive impact from from taking part, and I certainly saw I saw a few nods and Ursula with the thumbs up. So I think I think you were speaking for for most people there. Um, if anybody attending this evening does have any um, questions that they'd like to um, like to interrogate our five artists with, I know that everyone would be really keen to hear from you. Um, the um, social media handles, I think, have been posted in the chat, um, and certainly um, we can we can we can get people in touch with one another if you if you have any questions that occur to you afterwards. Um, just a reminder that the micro commissions exhibition, um, in which all five artists work here this evening, features along with the seven other projects. Um, this exhibition continues up until Sunday the 6th of March in Aberdeen Art Gallery. So if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sure that tomorrow people will be heading along having heard so much um, so much about these, these five fascinating projects. So a huge thanks to um, Ursula, Juliet, Lynn, Anne and Kimberly for um, taking part in this evening's conversation and thank you for people for attending. I certainly um, could think of no better way to spend my evening. So thank you very much and keep safe everybody.